Good morning, Springs Church. Let's stand and begin in worship together this morning with this call to worship. Let's say this together. We give you thanks, great God, for the hope we have in Jesus, who died but is risen and rules over all. We praise you for his presence with us. Because he lives, we look for eternal life, knowing that nothing past, present, or yet to come can separate us from your great love, made known in Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup runs over. 
Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Good morning, everyone. It's wonderful to see you all again this morning. For those of you that don't know me, um, my name is Jared Sism, and my wife and I are the college ministry delegates here at the Springs. Another year has passed us by. It's hard to believe um, that um, it's already been a year since we did this already. Um, but today is the day that we have set aside to honor our graduating seniors that are um, graduating college here in the community. Seniors, I'm sure this last year is not what you anticipated your final year of college to be. It looks very different. Despite all these difficult times, you should be extremely proud of all the things that you have accomplished. I know that this church body is. The memories that you have made from these past few years will last you a lifetime. The Bible tells us in Proverbs 3, verse 5, that if you trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own, lean not on your own understanding, um, and that you acknowledge him, he will direct your paths. As you start down this new path in your life, it will be easy to think that you can do everything on your own, especially once that you're out on your own, you start a new career path, um, and begin to think that you have everything that you need. But I want to encourage you, that you uh, to acknowledge God and that you'll, um, he will direct your paths. I also want to encourage you that you will find a community, whether you stay here in Edmond or that you go to another community, that you will find a community of believers that will be there to back you and support you. Before I pray this morning, I wanted to go ahead and acknowledge our seniors that are going to be graduating this year. So if you are a senior this year, would you mind standing for us so that we can recognize you, please? Anyone? A couple over here. Do we have any more? It's so bright in here, I can barely see. Three? Okay. Let's give a round of applause for these seniors that are graduating. <laughs> you all can go into them. Oh, we had a couple in the back, too. My bad. I also just want to um, take a moment to acknowledge as well our seniors this year. Um, it's been incredible because many of you may know that my wife and I, Cassie, actually um, just recently had our first um, baby. Thank you. And that, <laughs> I definitely underestimated what I was capable of doing when I had a baby. And you all probably think that's funny for your parents. Um, but I am just so thankful for the college students this year. Um, Cassie and I were actually considering um, just bringing all the college students over here and having them join the adult class and um, intermingling with all of you. But instead, they decided to step up and take on the leadership of the college ministry this year. And so each of them have contributed in a certain way or another. Several of them have led on Wednesday nights. Um, but also, in addition to that, Cassie and Abby, who stood up over here, actually took the initiative to take on the college ministry, especially on Sunday mornings this semester, um, to teach class, and they even uh, took the students, uh, led a service project yesterday. So Cassie and I are just so grateful to see what these students have become, especially those who were here from their freshman year, and how they have transformed to being disciples of God, and we're just so thankful for that. <laughs> Let's go ahead and pray before we begin our worship this morning. Heavenly Father, I come before you this morning with a grateful heart for the completion of another academic year, and for giving our church the opportunity, though it was short, to play a part in the lives of these college students and our graduates, and for them playing a part in our lives as well. Father, despite all the difficulties of the pandemic this past year, we are grateful for you helping them reach this incredible milestone in their life. God, I pray that they don't forget that you have helped them come this far, and as they start this next chapter of their life as young professionals, to remember to trust in you with all your heart, their heart, and to acknowledge you and help them to remember that you will direct their paths as lo so long as they do this. God, I pray that you also um, bless and guide these graduates, uh, graduates as they reach their end and as they begin this new chapter in their lives. May what they have learned allow them to be truly women and men for your kingdom, and may what we have learned from them enable us to do the same. Father, we thank you for giving us the opportunity to build our community with these young men and women while they were here. Though most of them may be leaving this community, we know that they will always be with us and part of the Springs family. And Father, I pray that they can also find a community that will serve them and where they will be served in the way as they begin this new journey. 
God, I pray that you also be with us this morning as we do our worship service. We ask all these things in your son's name. Amen. Let's stand and continue to praise God together this morning. Blessed are the merciful. Blessed are the poor. Mercy will be shown to you. The reign of God is yours. Blessed are the sorrowful. Blessed are the meek. All the earth belongs to you. God will give you peace. Lord, I think of my our sins to God and one another and receive his forgiveness anew. Almighty God, you have raised Jesus from the grave and crowned him Lord of all. We confess that we have not bowed before him or acknowledged his rule in our lives. We have gone along with the way of the world and failed to give him glory. Forgive us and raise us from sin that we may be your faithful people, obeying the commands of our Lord Jesus Christ, who rules the world and is head of the church, his 
his body. Amen. Almighty God, who sent his Son into the world to save sinners, bring us his pardon and his peace now and forever. Amen. is yours.
hands I will live. Amen. God, thank you so much for all you do. And that's all we can say is thank you. We can't give enough. We can't sing enough. But we know you accept what we give. And we pray that our hearts are pure and that they are attuned to you. And God, I pray that that we please you in the words that we sing and the way that we speak. Thank you for this time that we um, get to honor you in this way and remember exactly just what you did and the way that you just live again. We honor you in this bread and cup. In Jesus' name, amen. The elders are around the room if you need prayer or encouragement. Come to the tables. stars they wept the morning sun was dead the savior of the world was fallen his body on the cross his blood poured out for us the weight of every curse upon him heaven looked away the son of god was laid in darkness a battle in the grave the war on death was waged the power of hell forever broke
stand and sing hallelujah with us. We sing hallelujah. We sing hallelujah. We sing hallelujah. The Lamb is overcome. We sing hallelujah. We sing Tell me the 
story most precious, sweetest that ever was heard. What fortune lies beyond the stars, those dazzling heights too vast to climb. I got so high to fall so far, but I found heaven as love swept low. My heart beating, my soul breathing, I found my life when I laid it down, upward falling, spirit soaring. I touched the sky when my knees hit the ground. What treasure waits within your scars? This gift of freedom gold can't buy. I bought the world and sold my heart. You traded heaven to have me again. My heart beating. My soul breathing, I found my life when I laid it down, upward falling, spirit soaring. I touched the sky when my knees hit the ground. Find me here at your feet again, everything I am. Reaching out, I surrender. Come sweep me up in your love again. And my soul will dance on the wings of forever. Find me here at your feet again. Everything I am. Reaching out, I surrender. Come sweep me up in your love again. And my soul will dance on the wings of forever. My heart beating, my soul breathing. I found my life when I laid it down. Upward falling, spirit soaring. I touched the sky when my knees hit the ground. Find me here at your feet again. Everything I am, reaching out, I surrender. Come sweep me up in your love again. And my soul will dance on the wings of forever. Upward falling, spirit soaring. I touch the sky when my knees hit the ground. Good morning, church. I want to welcome all of you who are here. And all of you that are joining online, welcome in the name of Jesus. And if you're visiting with us today, we are very, very happy that you're here. And so I want to ask something of us. As more of us are coming back to church, one, I want you to, if you're a member here, if you see an unfamiliar face, Go introduce yourself. And that's going to come with some risk because it may be unfamiliar because you don't recognize their face with the mask, as I've already done once this morning. And because as we're coming back, it may be that you haven't seen them in a while, so you might not recognize their COVID haircut. Okay? So be vulnerable. Be forgiving. Go reintroduce yourself to someone you don't know or reintroduce yourself to someone that you do know, but maybe haven't seen in a while. Is that a deal? Can we all agree to that? Can I get an amen? All right, that's pretty good. That's, that's better than the amens I usually get, so I feel confident now, all right? Our vision here at the Springs is to be transformed into the image of Christ so that many will find their way to God. 
And I can't think of a better way to talk about transformation, spiritual transformation, than to talk about discipleship. We're in the Gospel of Mark in a sermon series called Following Jesus, where we want to talk seriously about discipleship. And we're being transformed by gathering together in the name of God, by growing into his image through discipleship, and by being sent out and going out into his world by the power of the Holy Spirit. And so this year in particular, we're talking about growing We're talking about transformation, and there's no better way than to talk about that than discipleship. So today, we're in Mark chapter 8, as we continue this sermon series on on following Jesus in the gospel of Mark. Mark chapter 8, verse 31, it says this. It says, Jesus, he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and raised again after three days. He spoke plainly about this, and he took Peter with him, he took him aside, and he began to rebuke him. And when Jesus turned and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter and says, Get behind me, Satan! You don't have in mind the things of God, the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. Then he called the crowds to him along with his disciples, and he said, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. Let's pray. Father, as always, we give you thanks for your word that is transformative, that we believe somehow if we give ourselves to your word, the words in scripture the word of life, Jesus, that we will be transformed. That somehow, if we follow and become a disciple, that our lives will be transformed. And so today, as you speak your word to us, give us ears to hear, hearts to follow, give us lives that will obey. And God, I ask for the gift of preaching. It's in the name of your son, Jesus, your word to us, we pray. Amen. I love a good TV series. And there's basically kind of two types of TV series, right? There's the the kind of TV show that you can watch and you can do a one-off watch. I feel like for those of you in the room uh, that are old enough to remember this, Seinfeld, you can go back and watch reruns of Seinfeld and you can watch one episode and you can can do that. But those are kind of episode-based TV shows. There are other TV shows which kind of have a, a, a narrative arc that are happening, right? These are the shows that you want to binge watch. You know what I'm saying? It's like because one episode carries on to the next one, and that's why you want to binge watch them because you finish watching one, and they leave you, leave you with a cliffhanger, and you go on to the next one, right? You just have to keep going and binge watching these shows. Well, one of the things about shows that have like a, an arc to them that are arc-based, they have like this narrative that continues over the course of a season or over the course of an entire show, is that they'll begin every new episode with this. Previously on, you know what I'm talking about? You know those TV shows? Previously on Lost. I feel like, remember, Lost was one of those. How many of you ever watched, this is an older TV show, 24? Do you remember that one? Previously on 24. Like, you couldn't start in the middle on 24. It was this idea of this show, every episode was one hour of a day and 24 hours of the day. So to follow the day, you had to follow the whole episode, the whole series. And so if you couldn't just binge watch for eight hours a day, you'd come back the next day and it said, previously on 24. And they give you a recap. The Gospel of Mark works like one of those arc TV shows. 
Now, you can watch an episode. You can watch one text and still enjoy it and still get something from it. But I think the Gospels work more like an arc narrative episode. And so in the spirit of those kinds of TV shows, today, I want to begin with this. Previously, in the Gospel of Mark, following Jesus. Mark begins this way. Mark begins, this is the good news about Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God. Now, for most of us, we hear that phrase, and it's just a throwaway line. It's just how Mark gets us introduced. It's like the introduction sentence. I, some of you that are my students, you've heard me say this, because you're right in the middle of doing all this, you know, when you write a paper. You guys remember when you used to write papers? Aren't you so glad you don't have to write papers anymore, most of you? Right? So just enjoy this for a second because they're, they're suffering right now. Okay? So enjoy their suffering. So, guys, you, you know you're writing your paper? You know what the hardest part about writing a paper is? Well, there's lots of hard parts. Don't answer that question. The hardest part is what's the first sentence you're going to write? This is a paper about blah, 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 which is like not what you write. But you're like, I don't know how to start the paper. So it's like you invent some line that's like a throwaway line. That's how we want to think about Mark's gospel. This is not a throwaway line for Mark. Because Mark has something to say about what it means that Jesus is the Son of God. And part of our journey is to discover with Mark what it means that Jesus is Son of God. Previously, in the Gospel of Mark, following Jesus, chapters 1 through 8 are marked by two recurring kind of events. There's lots of demon possession stories in the Gospel of Mark. Tons. There's also lots of crowds that follow Jesus. Now, I know that happens in other Gospels, but in Mark in particular, it's the crowds and it's the demons. It's the crowds and it's the demons. And here's what comes up in Mark's Gospel, is that the people follow Jesus, but they don't know who he is. They're amazed. They're astonished. They're bewildered. They're confused. They're afraid. But here's the ironic thing. That... Interspersed in these stories about humans following Jesus are these demon stories. And every time the demons encounter Jesus, they know exactly who he is. They call him son of God or son of the most high. They know exactly who Jesus is, but they're out. And so the temptation for all of us is to say, well, of course they're out, Ben. They're demons. That's what demons do. That's why they're demons. No, resist that temptation. That's, that's not the assumption to make. The real question is, what do the demons know that the people don't that make them go, I know who you are, I'm out? That's the real question. Previously, on the Gospel of Mark, following Jesus, we have this story about this man being healed in stages Brett did a fantastic job preaching that text. And I think Brett's right. I don't know of any other story about Jesus' miracle or healing where he has to try more than once. It's an odd story, isn't it? I mean, never, never mind that he spits on the guy. That's totally weird. That's how he heals him. But it's a story about coming to see and at first he sees like trees and then he sees more clearly and so in mark chapter 8 if you go to the next slide this is mark is saying this that we are learning to see jesus everybody sees jesus differently which is one of the things that brett said we're all in different stages about where we see jesus but mark he wants to say to you and I and to the disciples that we're 
that the process of discipleship is coming to learn to see who Jesus really is and what it means for him to be son of God. Previously, on Mark, following Jesus, you get to the very next story, and Jesus asks the question to his disciples, but who do you say that I, who do the people say that I am? And some say John the Baptist, and some say prophet, and some say Elijah. And then he turns to the disciples, and it's almost as if he turns right into the camera. If we're watching the TV show or the movie, he turns right into the camera, and he points at you, and he points at me, and he asks each and every one of us, but who? Who do you say that I am? This is the very central question for Mark, for the whole gospel. And I think this is the reason why. Because who you say Jesus is will determine how you follow. Who you say and understand Jesus to be. What he's about, where he's going, what he's doing, his way of life, what he loves. You understand that. Your view of Jesus will determine how you follow. Because who you say he is will determine for you what discipleship looks like. So, we come to the middle part of chapter 8. Something distinct happens in this story. There's a bit of a break. You have this central question, and it's almost this introduction to this new twist in the story. Because you kind of leave behind some of the crowds and some of the demon-possessed stories. And then you get these episodes that happen directly with the disciples. And so what you're going to see, if you go to the next slide, over the next today, over the next two weeks, the next three weeks, so today and two weeks, is you're going to see a pattern emerge. And the pattern is this. Jesus gives his passion prediction. There's a negative reaction by the disciples. And then Jesus teaches on discipleship. So you have passion statement, negative reaction by the disciples, teaching on discipleship. Passion statement, negative reaction by the disciples, teaching on discipleship. Chapter 10, passion statement, negative reaction, teaching on discipleship. This comes up, boom, 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 just like that. Eight, nine, and ten. So we have our first episode in this cycle. Happens in chapter eight, beginning in verse 31. It says this. He then began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the teachers of the law, and then he must be killed. And after three days, rise again. Hold that slide right there. This is Jesus' passion statement. Now, when you think about the word passion, this is a rhetorical question. I mean, I guess you can answer if you want. But what do you think about? A lot of people think about, like, I'm passionate about music. Like, I'm really into something. Like, I have a real strong desire for something. Right? I'm passionate about soccer. I'm passionate about you name it. But others think of this. They think passion like love. It's a passionate relationship. There's a lot of passion there. Or just someone that is passionate. Like, Ben, you're up there and you're passionate about this. Trying to be as passionate as I can be. But actually, that word passion that we get, while we, it is true, it is about 
something that we have a great desire for or energy for, or it could be used to talk about love and romance and things like that. That word passion actually comes from the word, the Latin word passio, which is a lot of English comes from Latin and Greek and other languages. And the word passio, it literally means suffering. So when you hear Jesus' passion statement, you hear his suffering statement. Do you hear it? He began to teach them the son of man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the teacher of the law and that he must be killed. His passion statement. You guys remember the movie Passion of the Christ? Anybody? Mel Gibson's movie, right? Now, then that movie is not named because of the passion we talked about earlier. Because Jesus is just excited. Because Jesus is really passionate about this. That movie is really named The Suffering of the Christ. And if you've seen that movie, it makes a lot more sense. There's a lot of suffering <laughs> that happens in that movie. It's a brutal. Here's another thing that I find interesting. And I just, I have to share it. That we have our word compassion and it comes from that Latin calm with passio, suffering. Isn't that a great definition of, suf of, of compassion? To be with someone in their suffering, that's literally what it means to have compassion on someone. To be with them in their suffering. Then he goes on in verse 32. says this. That Jesus spoke plainly about these things. There was really no confusion. That's what he means by that. There was no confusion. He spoke plainly about his suffering and death. And Peter took him aside and Peter began to rebuke him. But when Jesus turned and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter. He said, get behind me, Satan. You don't have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. Now, the question arises for us, why in the world would Peter be rebuking Jesus. I mean, at least he pulls him aside. He doesn't like publicly do it. He pulls him aside. But why would he do this? And to understand why Peter is doing this, you've got to go back to the, actually the previous episode, the previous story that happens right before. It says this. Go on to the next slide. He says, this is in chapter 8, verse 20. It says that Jesus and his disciples went on to the village around Caesarea Philippi. And on the way, he asked, who do people say that I am? He said, some John the Baptist, some say Elijah, still others the prophets. But what about you? He says, who do you say that I am? And Peter says, what? You are the Messiah. Which is the same as saying in Greek, you are the Christ. And as I said before, Christ... If you ask, what does that mean? Christ is not Jesus' last name. Christ is actually a title, just like Messiah is a title. And Christ and Messiah, they actually mean this, the anointed one, the king. And so when Jesus starts talking about suffering and dying, now you can start to see why he pulls him aside. Actually, I want a little help with this. Noah, would you come up here? Come on up. Everybody give Noah a big hand. I, I would ask for a volunteer. So any of you guys could have volunteered, but because of COVID, I know I can be close to him, and I could yell at him like Peter. And he's used to it because he's my son. All right, so Noah is Jesus, and I'm Peter. So... Jesus says to the disciples, hey, the Son of Man is going to suffer and die and be rejected. He's going to die, and on the third day, he's going to rise again. And Peter's thinking, oh, my gosh. He doesn't get it. He totally doesn't get it. If you're a parent, have you ever thought that? That's why I brought my son up here. I'm like, oh, he doesn't get it. Plus, he uses this phrase often. He uses this phrase, son of man, which is from Daniel. And son of man is that the, 
the Son of Man's going to come down. He's going to establish a kingdom, the entire world. He's going to bring justice and peace, and he's going to reign. He hears Son of Man, he's thinking, and then he hears Son of Man's going to suffer and die. So Peter comes up to Jesus, says, Jesus, man, come here, dude, come here. What are you talking about? Suffering and dying? That's not what kings do. Kings sit on the throne. Kings don't suffer and die. Come on, man, get it together. And then Jesus says what? Get behind me, Satan. Get behind me, Satan. <laughs> Everybody give a big hand. He's wanted to do that to his dad his whole life. Get behind me, Satan. Kids, don't say that to your parents. It's not going to go well. It went okay here. It's not going to go well later. This is basically saying, hey, Peter, get out of my sight. I don't want to see you anymore. You don't have the things in, of God in mind, but the things of human beings. Jesus is not saying that this whole suffering death thing is a gamble that's worth it, that might pay off. He's informing his disciples that he will walk into death and that this is the way to life. This is not a risk and a gamble he's willing to take that maybe will pay off. He's saying, no, this is the way. This is the way. So then he goes on and teaches them about discipleship. He says this, he says, then he called the crowd along with him, his disciples, and he said, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. Whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. Whoever wants to be my disciple, Jesus says, you must deny yourself and take up your cross and follow me. According to Jesus, discipleship is taking, denying yourself and taking up your cross. You can go to the next slide. Following Jesus means taking up your cross. There is no if, ands, or buts about it. If you want to follow Jesus, you must deny yourself, which is the exact opposite of P Peter's own political ambitions. Because when he hears the cross, he hears shame. Execution, there are three types of execution in the Roman world. If you're very rich, you get poisoned. So it's quick. If you're a Roman citizen, you get be beheaded. But if you're poor or an outcast, you get executed on a cross, naked, hanging for days, struggling for life, and everybody watches you die. They don't just hear, oh, I got to deny to my desires. No, they hear. They have, each and every one of them, I guarantee it, have walked past someone hanging on a cross. What? Take up your cross? If you want to save your life, if you lose it, if you lose your life, you'll save it. Denying yourselves means denying, perhaps for us, our own ambitions, like Peter's own ambitions. It, it means, perhaps, denying you getting your own way. However th you think the world should be run, and we all have our opinions about how we think the world should be run, maybe it means that you deny how you think the world should be run. Maybe it's Denying a particular, your politics, how you think it should be. Maybe it's this. Maybe it's denying your rights. But I have a right. It is my right to do this. Yes, yes, it is your right. And now Jesus says, it is your opportunity for denial. It is your opportunity. Because if anybody had rights and privileges, it was the Son of God. 
all the rights and privileges of God, and he denied all of it to take up the cross and die. It means losing your life. It's about acts of humility and restraint, of self-control, of forbearance, of perseverance, of patience, of long-suffering. It is about physically losing your life, and the disciples did that, but it's also in a very practical way about these things. It's about bearing with people. It's about losing your life in the way that you, you hold your tongue, waiting patiently, mastering your irritation, avoiding the spotlight, refusing to respond to insults, allowing others to cut in line and in every other else thing they cut in front of you in life. It's about being first to apologize. As if you were in class this morning, we talked about apologizing. Holly Osborne talked about that. Losing your life means you don't seek to win every argument. Because Jesus even, as Brett pointed out, Jesus lost an argument in order to win the world. It is about losing what you want for the sake of someone else. You may have heard me talk about this young woman before. This is St. Teresa of Lisieux. She was born in 1873. She lived a fairly short life. She died in 1897. She died at the age of 24. She died of tuberculosis. But she's a remarkable life that she was the youngest person to ever be canonized as a saint in that world. It's because of her remarkable life, and even people have commented, she is the most significant saint or exemplar of the Christian faith in the modern time. She was born in France. And at age 15, she joined a monastery. She gave her life to Jesus. If that wasn't enough, she gave everything to her life to Jesus. It wasn't enough. She... She reflected on what it meant to lose her life. And what she noticed in what's called the little way, she developed this thing called the little way. What she noticed is that it was very easy for to talk to all the, the, the sisters in the monastery who were well-liked and loved. He said, but you know what? They didn't need, they were the most liked and loved and you could spend your time with them and you enjoyed it. They just were agreeable and wonderful and kind and loving. But they didn't really need that as much as the sisters that weren't as agreeable. And she talks about, but it's those imperfect souls. And what she doesn't mean is, she means everyone's an imperfect soul. But those souls, those people that are irritable, you don't agree with them. You don't really like them. You don't really think like them. They don't have good manners or the proper way of being in the world. You just think, ah. And she gave her young life to go out of her way for those people. To, do, to, to deny herself and what she wanted. To lose her life, to lose what she wanted for them. And she said, and I tried to do this even if I knew they would never change. Because I've been sick, and when I was sick as a young girl, even though I, I wasn't ever going to be cured of these things, these ailments that I had, and she had lots of ailments, my mother didn't stop loving me even if I couldn't be cured. So the question for us is this. What are you willing to deny? Is it ambitions? Are you willing to deny your dreams for Jesus? 
Maybe it's what you want. Maybe there's certain things that you really, really, really want that you need to deny. Maybe there's sin in your life that you need to deny in order to follow Jesus. Maybe it's how you see the world, how you think the world should be run. Maybe you need to let that go a little bit or a lot. I know I do. Maybe there are rights that you just know you have. Maybe those are opportunities to deny and follow Jesus. The question is this, what are you willing to lose? Pride? Are you willing to lose your pride? Are you willing to lose being right? Are you willing to give up your uncompromising nature? Are you willing to lose the anger and bitterness and grudges that you hold? Are you willing to lose control, getting your way? Are you willing to lose your tongue? You don't always get to say what you want or exactly how you feel. You're going to be going to willing to lose your impatience, willing to lose the spotlight. Are you going to be willing to say you're sorry? Are you willing to lose defending yourself in what is yours? Protecting yourself in all that you hold dear. Are you willing to lose protecting yourself and all that you hold dear to trust that the denying, cross-bearing way of Jesus is the way to life? What are you willing to deny? What are you willing to lose? Let's stand. Lord, I take up my cross, deny myself to follow you. I count all things as lost, I give it all to follow you. Lord, I take up my cross, deny myself to follow you. I count all things as lost. experienced loss Jesus knows your loss if you've lost people lost positions of authority lost pride lost honor lost relationships if you've lost Jesus knows exactly how you feel. And the challenge is this, that because Jesus has called you to follow him, he has called you to take up your cross, to deny yourself, to take up your cross and follow. What are you willing to deny? What are you willing to lose? May God's grace and his peace 
and his love and his salvation rest with you now and forever.